a story, thank you, Gina, that um, in case you've forgotten, you have a ministry too. Every Christian has a ministry. And, and maybe at times you don't think of it as a ministry, but it is a ministry. Every Christian is an ambassador for Jesus Christ according to the Scripture. Every Christian is a servant or minister. The kingdom of God is a kingdom of priests, the priesthood of all believers. And every priest serves in God's holy temple. And so your life is one of ministry, whether you realize it or not. Like, I, I think I've got a good example of this. Uh, one of my guys uh, here in our fellowship, when he retired as a, from being a contractor last year, said, if you know somebody in the church or out that needs help or just advice, electrical, plumbing, construction, I'd be more than happy uh, to help free of charge, you know, especially if they don't have the income. And uh, so I, I send them uh, to a place two days ago. And, um, you know, when you're on the other side of the situations like I am, where I don't know beans about any of that stuff, um, it's kind of sometimes anxiety ridden trying to make the right wise choices and so John went in to do this for another person and uh, settled the storm in that person's life right gave good advice wisdom observation and so I texted him back and I said um, Jesus said blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God Thank you for being a peacemaker by using your gifts and abilities in that area to bring peace to another person's life who knows very little about those areas, and whether she's being taken advantage of or not, or whether the job is being done or not. That's his ministry, you know, with those abilities. That's his ministry, and every Christian has a ministry. Don't, don't forget that. And so uh, as we talk about Jesus' ministry today, uh, here's my starting observation. Jesus is not who some people want him to be. He is better than anyone ever could dream he could be. So as you've read through this chapter uh, this week, maybe a couple of times at least, you know that Jesus disappoints people on a regular basis. This chapter is filled with people who were disappointed with Jesus in who he is versus who they would prefer him to be. I read an article last month titled, No, Jesus Was Never a Racist by Andrew Wilson. The claim that Jesus was a racist is based on the story of Jesus healing the daughter of a Syrophoenician woman. When she asked him, as you will recall, to heal her daughter, Jesus said, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. The argument goes, hey, did you read that? Jesus has been racist, dismissing foreign people like her as dogs. And so I thought about that article in reference to all of our conversations about race over the past year and some of the conclusions people have made about race in America. Like, if you are a white person, you are a racist automatically. That's one of the observations that has come out from some people and if you are a minority observation too you could never be a racist because you are a minority now both observations uh, conflict with my observations and experiences and conversations with people over the years I believe you can be colored white 
and not be a racist. I believe you can be a minority and be a racist as well. So in this article about the observation that Jesus was a racist because he called her a dog, Wilson writes, there are powerful arguments against deeming Jesus a racist, but ultimately the best reason to resist the verdict is contextual. Meaning what? If you read Matthew 15, 21 through 28, where Jesus does call her a dog, he is not talking about race at all, is he? What is he talking about? His mission. First to the Jew, and then to the Greek. And so, Jesus is not only innocent of being a racist, he's actually better than anyone ever imagined he could be in terms of race relations. Now, some groups want Jesus to be a racist because they are, all right? And so there have been in history uh, some groups, usually made of white people, who are racist, and who claim they have the backing of Jesus in terms of their belief. And some people want Jesus to be a racist so they can discredit him, right, uh, in today's conversation. But both groups ultimately should be highly disappointed uh, in what they want because Jesus is not a racist, has never been a racist, and will never be a racist. So in other words, be prepared as we study tonight to realize that the reasons why people found Jesus so disappointing has more to do with them than it does with Jesus himself. So the idea that Jesus is better than anyone ever dreamed he could be is connected to an observation I read a few years ago that goes something like this. Even the best, most creative writers in the history of mankind could never have imagined and conceived of a character like Jesus and wrote about him the way the gospel writers did under inspiration from God. He is like so much better than anyone could ever imagine the Son of God being in human flesh. Now, Thomas Jefferson uh, revised the Gospels, as you will recall, uh, in order to make Jesus more reasonable. You know, he took out all the miracle stories and other things that he thought just didn't jive with a, a realistic Jesus. And uh, it's because he believed that Jesus in the Gospels was unbelievable. Could it be? Could it be who he's really described as being? He is, he is beyond exceptional and amazing in every single way. And so Jefferson, in order to correct that, you know, uh, eliminated uh, potential uh, material from the Gospels. That again, just continues for me to reinforce the idea of how amazing Jesus is and how he is really beyond our comprehension in terms of how good he is. So I'm going to walk you through this chapter and identify ways Jesus is not who some people want him to be, either then or now. And we'll start with Jesus' baptism on page 322 of the story. Jesus is baptized. Originally, John wasn't excited about the idea of baptizing Jesus, but ultimately, he did baptize Jesus. Now, the text doesn't suggest that there is anyone at that day and time disappointed in Jesus because he was baptized. Uh, but I'm taking the perspective of the here and now where there are people who are like disappointed in the fact that Jesus was baptized because they don't believe in baptism. And they ward people away from the waters of baptism. Uh, they teach that baptism is unimportant and non-essential. And because they think that and believe that, I've, I've got to imagine you know, the value that Jesus places on baptism is one that is difficult for them to wrestle with, right? And to uh, mess with their sort of bias in regards to baptism. So my question for you tonight uh, in this area is, um, how did we get to the point 
in Christendom uh, where proclaimed followers of Jesus Christ began to downplay the importance of or totally dismiss the idea that baptism is an important part of God's story in our lives. Like, how did we get there? Anybody have any thoughts, Tony? Well, my understanding is that during the Reformation movement, everybody, Wesley, Calvin, all those guys, even Martin Luther, had to, had to be somewhat different in order to attract followers. I mean, the way you create a crowd is you have to change, even if it's something small, mm -hmm. you have to change something small to get people to leave this guy to come follow you. Mm -hmm. So my understanding is that that's kind of how it got away from, shifted from what the gospel says about what we should okay. do from Christians to where we are today. Okay, there's something in that. Uh, that I agree with, you know, in the Reformation of the 1500s, and therefore, one of the big, like, improvements the Reformers made was in the understanding that we are saved by grace, not by works. You know, for centuries, we're saved by works. One work, which is baptism, as if baptism was a work that could save you. So the problem with the Reformers while they began to more correctly teach salvation by grace and grace alone, is that they felt like that conflicted with the idea of the essential nature of baptism, which of course it does not, but that was one of their struggles, don't they? But doesn't the baptism, I mean, in baptism, there, it's called a work, but really you're being baptized. Yeah. What work are you doing? No, you are totally submitting no work to the there. person baptizing you, in submitting to what God is actually supernaturally doing as you are being baptized. Baptism is actually a work of faith and trust in God, not a work of merit as if it or anything else merits or earns your salvation, number one. Mm -hmm. So, their idea of the Messiah, uh, Jesus didn't fit that idea. Yeah, it fit with what the Old Testament predicted about Jesus. It did not fit with their preferred expectation and understanding of what the Messiah would be. Okay, but, but in, 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 in the New Testament, Oh, you're talking about the book of Revelation, you know, thought to be the last New Testament book written maybe in the late 60s. Some will go as far as in the 80s, somewhere AD. And, then, and, and I've heard that through a hundred. Okay. What's your point? So from that point, we have... Okay, keep going. Get it to baptism. Uh, last week when we started with the, the birth of the king, uh, Mary and Joseph both accepted that they were going to have... They believed. They believed. Yes. So, well, they, accept, they accepted what the angels told them. Correct. And 12 years later, they had forgotten, in my opinion, Forgotten, didn't really understand everything about yes, they, they, Jesus. And, and yes. They found they said, you know, okay, let's get the baptism. Why have you dishonored us like that? So All right. I don't, I don't know what the, like in the beginning, the very, you know, in the beginning in, in Genesis, in the beginning, it doesn't say in the Bible that. Okay, that's, uh, we're starting here at zero. 
and we're going to figure out from here forward till we get to uh, BC and AD. I mean, okay, so let me let me just take it take it from there. Uh, one of the earliest things we know from church history in regards to baptism in terms of the shift from immersion, for instance, to sprinkling or pouring, uh, is, in, is in a case involving novation in someone on his deathbed, right? Who couldn't be obviously immersed. And so, you know, the exception was made out of practicality. You know, we will sprinkle some water on him and call it baptism. So one of the sort of movements from biblical baptism uh, became like what is a matter of convenience, right? Not necessarily what the Bible says. There was like really no misunderstanding in terms of what the word baptism meant. I mean, it meant to immerse the, the plunge. But So then we have a case of like, um, you know, convenience modifying the mode of baptism. Then you had the development of the idea of original sin, that babies are born sinful and headed to hell. Uh, unless they're baptized, and since the Bible says he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, it became important to baptize those babies, otherwise they would not be saved. And so then we had this move from believer's baptism, right, to some kind of baptism being done upon you, not based on your faith, but based on the faith of someone else. And so history is sort of... Uh, full of, of those kind of examples and sort of movements away from baptism uh, to where now, you know, uh, uh, lots of churches uh, don't baptize at all. Uh, most do not baptize. Many do not baptize by immersion. Uh, many in the Protestant world that do baptize do not believe it plays a role in the salvation experience story. It's something done after the fact, after you're saved. You were baptized just to symbolize what has already happened. Whereas the Bible says uh, that while baptism is symbolic, it's also supernatural and connected to the moment of salvation when you cross over from death to life. And so you've probably had some of these conversations with uh, your friends who did believe in the importance of baptism. And you said, well, if it wasn't important, why was Jesus baptized, right? And if you're a follower of Jesus and really a disciple is one who mimics the movements of Jesus, what good reason could you give me for not being immersed like Jesus was immersed? So just a takeaway, kind of a funny sort of takeaway, how some people might be disappointed in Jesus because he was baptized. Then you go to page 322, after his baptism, Jesus enters the wilderness for a period of temptation. And you just got to believe how disappointed Satan must have been in Jesus for not succumbing to those temptations. Satan spent a lot of time and effort in strategically planning uh, ways to like speak into some of the weak moments of Jesus' life and tantalize him with quick fixes, which by the way, when you look closely at those three temptations, they are like quick fixes, easy routes to your immediate problem. It's like self-gratification. You could end it all right now. And we all know how tantalizing that is, right? Uh, if I could just relieve this pain and this suffering right now, even if it's not the right way. I mean, uh, addiction is you know, all connected to like, it's the easiest and quickest way to relieve my pain or to, uh, you know, overeat or whatever it is to, like, you know, some people cut, right, in order to distract themselves from the mental and emotional pain in their life. It's like the most immediate thing they can do to find some relief. And yet Jesus would have none of it and chose the hard road and the faithful road to... Uh, um, you know, refuse Satan's temptation. So here's your question for this section. How did Jesus fight his battles with temptation in the wilderness? Like a softball pitch. Scripture. Scripture. I love the, the contemporary song, this is how we fight our battles. It's like repeated like a hundred times. This is how we fight our battles. And one way in which we fight our battles is with Scripture. 
I, I try to teach some of the guys that I mentor uh, to like put some scripture in your head that you could immediately use to respond to the temptations in your life. It will kind of walk you away from those temptations when you respond to it with the word of God just like Jesus did. Any questions about that section? All right. You good? So the next section, simply I want to observe on page 323, is where uh, John the Baptist identifies Jesus as the Lamb of God who what? Takes away the sins of the world. So he's pointed backwards to Passover, right? The blood of the Lamb. And he's also uh, pointing forwards to Jesus' ultimate sacrificial death. But what's so disappointing about this description of Jesus as a little, little lamb, little sweet lamb of God, is how most folks want Jesus to be a conquering gen general who takes no names, takes no prisoners, and just lays waste to all of their oppressors. And so, Lamb of God doesn't sound very, like, strong and tough, right? Uh, Tony, what do you got? So, do you think, I see a lot of this, you talk about the disappointment that people have, and what I see is, it's the Burger King motto, it's the Have It Your Way motto, mm. is that we, even today, I feel like, we take, we take what Jesus says and does, and we try to wrap it into our lives, instead of wrapping ourselves around God, Mm -hmm. want to fit Jesus into or mold Jesus into yes. what we think he should be versus what he is. Yes. And so I call it a bird game philosophy. Mm -hmm. but have it your way. And it's really like that's that's the message through this section of the story in my mind is it's not your way. It's mm. Jesus' way. And yeah. no matter whether they were good people like John the Baptist or right. they were the Pharisees, it doesn't matter who it, who it is that you come across. The disappointment comes because of a pre, uh, pre predetermined expectation of what they thought Jesus would be. So scripture would describe what you're talking about as idolatry. Right. And how man would create idols or false gods in their own image. How they would want them to be. And uh, that's the story of, of human history as opposed to uh, bowing the knee to whoever the one true God reveals himself to be like it or not uh, he is God and so yeah I, I can see that as well in this part Jesus is the Lamb of God now has Jesus ever disappointed you by calling you to sacrifice instead of triumph like meaning you're gonna do this and to the world you're gonna look like a loser and that's how they're gonna think of you when you're really a victor like me can you think of examples like that in your walk with Jesus where you chose the road of the lamb instead of the lion, right? Instead of biting someone's head off, you were a little lamb who submitted. Uh, Gina? The whole idea of surrender in our society is viewed as a loss, as a, as a less than, as a, you know, you weren't victorious if you surrendered, but that's what the whole Christian life is. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to surrender everything. Mm -hmm. And that's just counterculture. Yes. And I, I had to surrender yesterday. <laughs> mm -hmm. My somebody was misinterpreted what I did, and I didn't. I didn't keep. I didn't. I just chose not to argue. Chose said, not to argue or defend yourself. Right. I said I am so sorry. That's mm -hmm. the way you took it, and I will be more mindful of your feelings in the future. Yeah. Instead of saying, you know, you got this actually wrong. <laughs> I was in the right, and this is why you just, sometimes you skip over all of that. I'm going to justify myself, and you're going to allow someone to think you're wrong. You're going to humbly apologize and just try to do better for them. You, yeah. You're the lamb uh, instead of the lion. Uh, you know, I'm a Saints football fan, and our star wide receiver sent out a tweet yesterday that said something like, They'll try to tarnish your reputation, but I'm going to remain silent. It was about some of the choices he made that the coach has, like, second-guessed. But I thought, Michael, the moment he sent out that tweet, 
You were trying to defend your reputation. You know, to, to truly, you know, let it go, you would not say a thing. You just let us know that he's in the wrong and you're in the right by saying, they're trying to tarnish my reputation. It is so hard to be a lamb that remains silent and that doesn't run away. I'm told that lambs, they see predators, a lot of times they don't run away, they just wait for their turn to be eaten. <laughs> you, know? you know, sheep are known to be like some of the dumbest of all animals, right? And hope Jesus doesn't offend you when he calls you his sheep, right? Uh, we're not the smartest you know, folks around as human beings, and that's why we need a shepherd uh, to lead us. Now let's go to 323, 324. I want to talk about Nathaniel, right? So uh, some of John the Baptist boys are trekking after Jesus and wanting to get to know Jesus. And one of the boys... Uh, uh, wanted his um, uh, brother Nathaniel to come check out Jesus like he did. And on the bottom of page uh, 324, after he's told, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law. There you go, number one. Uh, Jesus is all over the Old Testament. You can read it and not see it, but you know he's all over the Old Testament. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And, and so Philip said, we found him. He's it. And then, uh, top of page 325, Nathaniel says, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Jesus of Nazareth sounded like a major disappointment to Nathaniel. Do you know why? Why he was so put off by the idea that the Messiah could be from Nazareth? Anybody? It's because Nazareth was this two, little two-bit, nowhere town. Nothing special happened there. No one special came from there. Jerusalem is where it's at, right? I mean, it's the mother of all things about God. And uh, Nazareth just didn't fit the profile of a VIP in service to God himself. Isn't it interesting how we can make such quick judgments? Kind of like here when... Uh, somebody from the north moves into your neighborhood and says, hey, I'm from New York. And you think, oh, yeah, I know what you're like. Or, or uh, oh, so, Phyllis. Or when you meet somebody from the south, Phyllis. Yeah, I was raised in Louisiana. And you think, oh, I know what these, these uh, hicks from the south are like, right? We can make these sort of quick judgments about people. So the, the thing I want to point out, here's the real question for you. Because Jesus did uh, wow Nathaniel. Yeah, I saw you, buddy. You know, when you're under that tree. What? what? You're seeing things and there's no way you could have seen. And so Nathaniel is wooed and wowed. And then Jesus says to him, You will see greater things than that. You will see the heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So this is like a line when I read... I want to make sure I understand instead of like, all right, that's a nice thing to say, but what exactly does that mean? So I want you to know what that means. What did Jesus mean when he said, you'll see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man? Anybody want to take a crack at that? Tony. The resurrection. The what? The resurrection. All right. No. Good choice. Good. Okay. It's, it's a potential. It's the <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. It could be, but I don't think it is. Anybody else? You're not going to be now that I'm so rude to Tony, right? <laughs> like, um, have you read this before in Scripture? Yeah, Jacob. Like, like this ladder? Yeah, Jacob. And you saw Jacob's ladder? Mm -hmm. Angels ascending and descending. You see how the story of Scripture, like works together like uh, that place is called what is it Bethel? No, Bethel like what does Bethel mean haven't looked at that part of this in a while it's like place of God or house of God in Jacob's experience this is where heaven and earth were meeting you got the ladder heaven and earth and like this great connection between the two and then when you have the most holy place in the temple, it's the place where Jews believe heaven and earth met, because that's where God was. Jesus is saying, I am the place where heaven and earth meet. Angels ascending and descending. I am the one reconnecting God in heaven 
with humans on earth below. And the way back and forth to God, to be part of God's family, is through me. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? I got some buyers on that interpretation. Tony's like, he's mad at me. No, I'm going to have to look at that. <laughs> what do you got, Stan? I mean, Yes. Yes. Well, actually, that happened before this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we do see other times when angels come and minister to Jesus, but I prefer my my observation on it. So we'll just move on uh, from there. Uh, three twenty-five, three twenty-six. Oh boy, Jesus' first miracle is what? Why did he have to do that? <laughs> His mama told him to. Yes, that's exactly why he had to do that. But for us, it just sort of muddies the waters. You know, water to wine. You know, is Jesus pro-alcohol or anti it Was it grape juice? It becomes just this big thing that Christians fight about, you know, and debate over. Why did it have to be water to wine where, you know, in our American culture, especially back in the days of prohibition and then now, you know, if you were raised in the church tradition like me, you know, all alcohol was forbidden. If you took one sip of alcohol, you were one sip drunk and therefore violating scripture. Therefore, Jesus couldn't be making wine. It must be grape juice. Nothing alcohol whatsoever. And so Christians take firm stances on both sides of this equation. What a disappointment to us that Jesus would do this out for all of us to read about and see and fight over. Um, you want to know how I handled the alcohol situation from Scripture? What I understand? Because if I tell you, um, some of you can become really disappointed in me because it may not match your conclusions. And some of you may like me a little more uh, because it matches yours. So, you know, when I look at all of the scriptures about alcohol, my, my major takeaways are, number one, drunkenness is always wrong. I think we can all agree on that one, right? Drunkenness is always wrong. Drinking alcohol can be potentially dangerous, right? Wine is a mocker. You know, it's potential. You know, I don't have a shot of getting drunk if I never drink alcohol. But if I socially drink, at least there's the at least capability of, like, forgetting how many glasses I've had and getting closer to the line of drunkenness. So a drunkenness is always wrong. Drinking is dangerous, but... In my mind, uh, drinking is not always wrong. You know, wine makes the heart merry, uh, says the psalmist. Uh, drinking a little wine can improve your physical health, according to the Apostle Paul. And so that's just sort of where I am. I believe that what Jesus made here was not Welch's. It was like wine. It was like as good a wine as the best wine that they would drink. But I do not look down upon or condemn those who conclude differently than me. Sometimes people who think differently do condemn me, you know, and I'm okay with that. This is just kind of how I honestly understand Scripture. And yes, there have been times in my ministry where I've thought, oh Lord, why did you have to, why'd you let John write about this? It would make the conversation. Uh, so much easier. Anybody want to say anything about that? Or can we just move on? Oh, what do you got, sweet lady? Well, Mary became a lot more Mary became a lot more important. You know, it's not my time. Mm. And Mary's, yeah. Is this, yeah, I don't, I don't know this part of like, church history well, but like in the Catholic tradition, is this like a story that helps them to paint a picture of like Mary having 
authority and why she is in the Catholic world like a mediator. Which means, is this kind of connected to that? I, I didn't know that for certain. Okay. So there's another problem. You know, the scripture says there's only one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Sunday morning, I'm just going to move on. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you get to page 327. I preached about what Sunday morning? Insiders and outsiders. Insiders and outsiders. Who's the insider? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. He's on the inside of Jewish society. Uh, who's the outsider? Samaritan the Samaritan woman. woman. She's about as far outside as a person can be in acceptable society. And Jesus navigates both terrains really, really well. He's like comfortable with folks anywhere. And everywhere. You got to get that way. At one time, I was not that way. I was raised as an insider. I was only comfortable being around insiders. Folks had gone to church all their lives, kind of believed a lot of what I believed. Socially, I was not comfortable hanging out with people who were not like me. I even avoided social situations like that. And, um, and uh, fortunately, the Lord has taught me how to, like, Traverse all waters now, uh, where I'm comfortable everywhere. You got to get that way. It's a human inclination to only want to be around people like you. It's called the ethnocentric principle in the study of missiology, right? Uh, so you got to make sure your friend list, your friend group list, your social group list is, is not just a bunch of people who are all like you, you know, thinking just about everything that you think and believe everything you believe. Uh, you got to be like Jesus, right? Where you rub elbows with all kinds of people the Lord brings into your path. And you learn how to speak their language like Jesus did. So Jesus does that with Nicodemus uh, and the Samaritan woman. Now in regards to Nicodemus, the biggest challenge for this insider, like any Jew, would be to believe that the human being standing in front of him is actually God. Because they've been taught all their life, God is not a human being, right? You worship God, not people. And so it would be like a big challenge. That's why Paul calls this as a stumbling block to the Jews, the idea that Jesus, because it's like hard to get their minds around the fact that Jesus came in the flesh. But he did. And Jesus was not just a great moral teacher. He was God, right? Not just a nice guy. He was God. That is like the epicenter of your faith, right? Jesus is Lord. Confessing Jesus is Lord. If you don't confess and believe that, you really can't be a Christian, can you? Unless you have faith that Jesus is the Son of God, God in the flesh. And so that was one of the earliest challenges of early Christendom, right? So you read about some of that in New Testament writings. You know, you know, folks, says Jesus didn't come in the flesh. He was just a spirit so we can worship him because he was never a man. Yeah, I think that's First John, by the way. You get a taste of that conversation. So that was one of the biggest challenges, and it would be for Nicodemus. Now, just as a, a side observation in the story of Nicodemus, I wanted to take you to 327 where um, Jesus says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the man, Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So I want you to understand what does this talk about snake in the wilderness and how is that connected to Jesus? That was when um, they disobeyed God and he sent venomous serpents among them and they were being bitten and dying and they had to do a Moses created a bronze serpent and put it up, and if they looked on it, they would live. Okay, you heard all that, remember that in the story? You know, they went through one of their complaining jags in the wilderness, and God said, send the snakes. And the snakes infiltrated the camp, a lot of folks died. The solution was, uh, all right, have this bronze uh, snake, you know, built on a pole, and if you look at it, uh, your snake problem will disappear. What was the point of that? Look at this bronze snake. You understand what the point is? Faith. Do what? Faith. Faith how, Maynard? Believing. Believing what, Maynard? Believing what he said. Ah, you see? 
You see if those snakes just magically disappeared? They go and say, what a coincidence, problem solved itself, or some guy goes around with some snake juice, you know, and oh look, we solved this problem. But the only way you could believe the snake problem was solved by God was to know, I just looked at that bronze thing, and it's gone. The only one that can get credit for solving this problem is God. Because looking at some snake on a pole does not solve your snake problem unless God is at work. So it is about faith. This is God solving this problem. And so in connecting Jesus being lifted up on the cross, like the only way your sin problem can be solved is if you look at Jesus. Can't be solved by you. Can't be solved by your good works. It can only be solved by Jesus. So, you know, the bronze snake was sort of a preview of coming attractions in terms of who your ultimate savior would be. I thought that was pretty cool. And then in the story of the Samaritan woman, Jesus crosses all of these racial, cultural, gender, religious barriers uh, to minister to the Samaritan woman. That would be a disappointment to some. It certainly was surprising to the disciples. Jesus is talking to a woman in public? A Samaritan woman? Uh, no less. Again, one of the early challenges of the Christian church was related to race and ethnicity, right? Jew and Gentile, we're better than you. You've got to be like us and Jesus in order to be saved, not just like Jesus. You've got to be like us Jews. That was a big challenge. Tony, what do you got? There's also subcultures within the Jews, the Essenes, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, yes. who all hated each other. Yes. So there was also that each one of those groups had their own expectations of what they were supposed to do. Yes. So even with, you're not just, I mean, you're not just crossing those big racial barriers, you're also crossing cultural barriers within the culture. Yes. It's almost like various political groups. They are. Right? Very, and fractions. Yes, yes. So Jesus is a great example uh, of this. Now, since last year, you know, I've been like, we're just like so white here on the Grand Strand. You know, there's just a small minority population. Wish it wasn't, but it just is, right? So I have like very few opportunities to like minister and rub elbows with minorities. And uh, so since last year, it's like, man, is there something we can do just to like speak love and, you know, care as all this racial talk is going on in the world to, to share the true story of God and how we see race the way God is. And I got to lead here and there, but coolest thing. Um, so I'm, I'm president of my Rotary Club this year. And one of my members brought in this new ministry. She's a uh, assistant principal at Myrtle Beach Middle School, African American. And last year, she and another person started a mentoring program uh, for minorities. Nothing else really like that, you know. And so, you know, our club is like partnering to sponsor some kids through that mentoring program, paying their way, and it's like. Man, finally found something, you know, I can be connected to that's, you know, speaking love and support uh, to the minority population here on the beach. And, and why I'm interested in is that is because Jesus is interested in that. He's interested in crossing these barriers, you know, male and female, Jew or Greek, you know, we are one in Jesus Christ. So that's just a side, side note to that. Okay, so we go to page 329 to 331. Uh, Jesus basically in this section is waging war against evil. He's casting out demons. He's healing the sick, healing lepers, calling tax collectors to follow him. And then ultimately on page 333, uh, building an army for God by selecting 12 apostles that will learn how to do exactly what Jesus does. Now the only observation I want to make is on page 330. Before Jesus 
heals the leper. It says, Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, be clean. And he was clean. Question. What was Jesus indignant about? What does that mean? It's pretty cool. Don't just read over it. Understand what it means. It's like, oh, yeah, I need to start feeling that way like Jesus does towards stuff like this. Jesus was indignant. He's annoyed, meaning he's annoyed, and he's angry or upset. So what is he annoyed by? He's not annoyed by the fact that the leper is saying, could you heal me? Not annoyed by that. He's annoyed by the fact that human beings that he created are being inflicted with things like leprosy, which in his world, pre-fall, is evil. That this good world that he made, this good world without all of this stuff that inflicts and hurts and damages human being, uh, is, is happening in the world because of its disconnection from God. And he's thinking, this is not the way it was supposed to be. My kids were not supposed to have to deal with this and be separated from me and have to fight all of these battles from the evil one. And so he's indignant and annoyed and he shows us by healing him that this is the way it will be at the reconciliation of all things in the new heaven and the new earth. All of these battles with illness and pain and disappointment that come from the enemy of God will be no more. And it bothers me that it still is right now. I mean, haven't you had some thoughts like that in your life? Like, this is not the way it's supposed to be. And things seem to be just going down the tube as fast as they can. And you hear about someone else going through a trial or turmoil that just kind of pops your head off. Like, how do people deal with this stuff? And in your indignancy, you decide to do something about it to remedy maybe just a little part of the pain and suffering in that person's life. Because in God's good world, these things aren't supposed to happen. The Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that creation is just tearing itself apart. Right? Even creation is groaning. If creation could talk and feel, it's saying... This is not what we were made for. All this mayhem and mess, tornadoes and hurricanes and loss of life. Creation is groaning. Christians are groaning, right? Because this is not the way it's supposed to be. And so we learn something from Jesus uh, about how being indignant can be a good thing when it moves you to action and mercy. Tina. What do you think God feels when a child is born not normal? One, I love that child. I have a plan and purpose for that child. But some of the challenges this child will face were not meant to be and would not happen had it not been for sin and the fall. It's sort where of the tearing away of everything, including genetics and biology and all kinds of things that have polluted the system, right? Because of the fall. That's, that's how I feel about it. But he also feels like this is not the final word in the child's life. Yes. And how does God heal some of these issues? You know, the curse of the fall is what for the woman? Pain and childbearing? Now, we seek to remedy the curse, right? Doctors come up with medicine, medical procedures to kind of like help ease some of that pain, curse of the fall, like a land that's going to be hard, you know, sweat of the brow. But God's people are about reversing the curse in the here and now, right? And so there's like inventions and tractors and air-conditioned tractors and other things that make tilling the ground. We're already in the business in, as the church of reversing the curse of Satan in the here and now that will ultimately be totally reversed uh, in the here after. Okay? And so why did Jesus send the leper away with the warning, hey, don't tell anybody about this? Tell me. Well, because the law required them to show themselves clean to the town. 
Mm -hmm. And so it was more, I feel like it was more about following the rules that the law had set in place. Yes. More than it was about glorifying what Jesus had done. Good point. And there are other times you'll notice when Jesus tells people, yeah. even demons, they don't tell anybody. And there's another reason why. If they start talking about Jesus, they'd give the wrong message about Jesus to people they didn't properly understand what he was about. And so they would give like a garbled, probably um, somewhat false message about who Jesus is. And so Jesus like, your PR is going to do more harm than hurt because I might have to undo probably some of the things you're going to say about me that aren't true uh, because I'm not a general. I'm, I'm not going to serve as a, a president. You know, I am a suffering servant. And the message that you want to send out is, Jesus, man, is going to pound every enemy in the ground and run this place like a Roman Caesar even better. So the chapter ends on page 334. And we're there, four minutes. We're right on time. Everybody relax. We're right on time. <laughs> With John the Baptist in prison. And uh, he's hearing things about the Messiah, you know, third hand while he's in prison, what's been going on. And uh, he asks his disciples, or he, he sends his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? What do you think is going on in John's mind that leads him to ask that question? Uh, Joseph? A little like in prison. <laughs> Oh, really? It was like a, a personal play. If you're the guy, like, I'm your advance team. Like, don't you want to get me out of here? I thought about that one. All right, I'll think about that one. Uh, what else? That's good. Um, John may have had an imperfect expectation of what the Messiah would look like as well. And so maybe he's thinking... You know, when they get this party started, right? Where we start taking names and banishing oppressors and things start looking the way it should look in Israel, like back in the day of King David. I mean, if this is the son of David, right? Line of David, King David. He ruled this place. He expanded the borders, right? I mean, uh, he took care of business. We were number one. All of the people groups were number two and beyond. Like, maybe John's thinking, um, I got this right or not? Because what I'm hearing about it's not maybe what I was expecting. Are you the one? And Jesus' response is what? You go tell John what you see and hear. And Jesus believes when they do, it's going to curb John's potential doubt or question. Don't you love this? The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. But then watch the next sentence. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Was that your question? Uh, well, somebody had pointed out uh, in your previous question in a comment, Crystal said he didn't want public attention yet. He still had work to do. Mm -hmm. and, um, so and that's true. That's, that's like a third potential thing for beside like crowd control issues. Right. Big crowds like get in the way of me moving from village to village. I was just, I was okay. just trying to share that comment okay. because I wanted to. Okay, what does that mean? Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now remember, when you're reading the Bible well, you read it contextually, right? Like what was said just before, and maybe what was said just after. So connect the dots. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. John has just asked, are you the guy? Jesus says, tell him this is what's going on. And blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Just because I don't meet your expectations, don't count me out. You know, just believe. Yeah. If I'm disappointing you in some way because I'm not meeting what you thought I should be and do, and yet you trust me and put your faith in me instead of like stumble over me and think, oh, I don't know if I can. Uh, blessed is the one who does not stumble on account of me. I know you guys see him as a loser, right? Crucified like a criminal. Uh, how, how's that going to help us? So people stumble over that. But the disciple says, oh, I believe. I believe he's our guy. So 
while Jesus is a disappointment to many, he is actually better than anyone could have ever imagined him to be. Jesus' ministry begins. May your ministry continue tonight. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this gathering of believers. Thank you for uh, communicating to us through your word. We thank you for the many over the centuries who preserved it, copied it, and died, God, so that we could actually read it tonight. Thank you for being a God who speaks and reveals himself. And God, uh, take what we've thought about and studied tonight and turn it into new fruit in our lives that God um, blesses those around us as we stay connected to the vine. We pray, God, your blessings upon Jana as she draws closer to beginning chemotherapy. We thank you, God, for baby Ezra's improvement as he nears finally getting to come home for the first time. We ask your blessings on Chuck as he feels effects from recent chemotherapy. And God, for all of the unspoken things happening in the body of Christ here tonight, we call upon your name uh, to heal the sick, uh, to uh, set the captives free. In Jesus' name, amen.